He talks about taking an oath. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. So this is the swearing in the sense of taking an oath. Yes, of course, if you swear to the Lord, you've got to keep that. His standard is much uh, deeper. But I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, it's the throne of God, or earth, his footstool, Jerusalem, the city of the great king. And don't take an oath by your head. You can't make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You shouldn't have to say, I swear by this. I swear to this. If you just mean yes when you say yes and no when you say no, people recognize that your word is good. Needing to take an oath for people to believe you is a sign that there's something evil going on. Don't be legalistic about, well, I didn't swear to this or I didn't swear to that. Every yes should mean yes. Every no should mean no. One lesson that Jesus teaches along this line is one that I find many people uh, at first glance balk at. It's about retaliation and about loving your enemy. You've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That indeed is in the law of Moses. The standard is called the lex talionis. That is the law of a standard. The standard is that the punishment should fit the crime, that you can't take a, a, a life because somebody took an eye. It's an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Jesus turns that around, though. But I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. That's the phrase that so many of my students just, just say, I don't think so. If anyone would sue you, and take your tunic, that is the basic garment that you wear. Let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. He has taught us a new and Christian way to deal with people who impose on us. Do not resist an evil person. Turn the other cheek. You know, there's actually strength in that. Somebody hits you, you just turn the other way and say, you want to do that again? Somebody is out to sue you. It's not right. They don't deserve it. Just give it to them. Give them more than they ask for. The government imposes uh, harsh responsibility on you. The background of this seems to be that the Roman forces could require any person under their domination to carry a soldier's pack for a mile. And those who were being dominated by the foreign government often resented that. And probably got to the mile marker and put that pack down and says, there, I've done a mile. But Jesus says that imposition on you, the Christian way is say, no, I'll carry, I'll carry another mile for you. Standards of Jesus are higher and deeper than just following the law. We didn't notice it in the in the written notes, but it's also talking about giving to people who would borrow from you. You get tired of it. You get tired of it. But he says, if they're taking advantage of you, go ahead and help them. It doesn't sound like our standard, but it's the Lord's standard. 
a similar vein, he talks about hate and love, loving your enemies. This is one of the teachings of the Sermon on the Mount that's most universally recognized and associated with Jesus. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the good and the evil. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even tax collectors do the same? Greet only your brothers. What are you doing more than others? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Love your enemy. Pray for your persecutors. Greet people who aren't your people. And in Luke's account of this or a similar sermon, he adds, Lend to those who can't pay you back. Be merciful as God is merciful. Or, as it says back here in Matthew, uh, be like God who sends his reign on the just and the unjust. That's what makes you godly. That's what moves you toward perfection. We'll see frequently now in this section of the Sermon on the Mount the phrase, but I say to you. You've heard this, but I say to you. And you'll see that over and over he is teaching that being true to what God has taught us has to go all the way to the heart. It can't be just a surface loyalty to God's law. In doing this, he draws comparisons between sins that we might classify in different categories. First of all, murder and anger. You've heard, do not murder. What society is there that doesn't have such a law? And certainly, it is it's solidly in the law of Moses. But then he moves on, and he says, even though you've always heard, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, there we have it in verse 22, but I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Well, nurturing your anger Insulting your brother, calling him an empty-headed fool. These are subject to judgment, according to Jesus, just like murder is. He says insulting your brother ought to go to the Sanhedrin, the council, the, the high Jewish court. And then in the harshest terms yet, he says if you're going around calling, your, calling someone a an empty head, a fool, you're liable to the hell of fire. Now, Jesus talks about hell more than anybody in the New Testament. We don't always think of him that way. But he's trying to get all the way to the heart and saying, are you insulting people? Even the silly names you throw out. Now, is Jesus talking about teasing? Well, it could be. But he's talking about when you are insulting someone, when you're out to hurt someone and express your anger to them. He says, those are sin. Murder is a sin, but these are sins. And notice he's talking about the sin that would underlie murder. He wants you to stop it before that happens. In fact, if we pick up in the 23rd verse, we see what he's teaching. If you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, you be put in prison. Truly I tell you, you'll never get out of it until you've paid the last penny. 
Jesus says you need to recognize when there's tension between you and someone else and you need to go settle that. It's so important you shouldn't make a pretense of worship when you know that there's some difficulty that you can settle. You need to settle it. If you don't, things are going to get worse. And that's the theme in this section of Matthew. Deal with the problem in the heart before it becomes the obvious sin. God is looking all the way to your heart. In the next section, Jesus compares adultery and lust and then moves on to divorce. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, all societies and certainly and clearly the Jewish law condemn adultery. But I say to you that this looking to lust is a heart like an adulterous heart. Or as the English Standard Version says, looking with lustful intent. Perhaps we need to pause and recognize that Jesus doesn't say anyone who feels a temptation, anyone who notices sexual attraction. He says the one who's looking with lustful intent. Not that that's uncommon. It's not the same thing as just being human. He says your heart is sinful and in just the same way that the adulterer's heart is sinful. And so what does he say to do about it? <clears throat> Here he uses uh, hyperbole, exaggeration on purpose for an effect. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. I told you Jesus frequently speaks of hell. He is talking to people and saying that person who looks with lustful intent is sinful in his heart. And so he says if your eye, if your look is is your temptation? Stop it. Get rid of it. He then says, whatever part of you is pulling you towards sin, cut it off. Now, how would you really apply that? Well, my observation from dealing with people as a minister through the years, uh, seeing people around me that I love, who've had problems. People commit adultery, usually not in a sudden burst of uncontrollable desire, but adultery, that form of sexual sin that includes cheating on someone that's married, on your partner, or cheating with someone else's partner. That usually comes from a relationship. And the cutoff means, as painful as it may be, leave the situation, leave the relationship if it's going down that wrong way. I knew someone once who, just as she was about to get married, was also having an affair with her boss. When it came to light, the only thing she could do, the right thing to do, and the thing she did was quit her job immediately. And that was a difficulty. You cut off whatever is going to put you in danger of hell. And that includes the relationships that are going in the physical direction that you have no right to. That could lead to adultery. In a similar vein, he talks about divorce. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. That's a strict standard, particularly compared to what our society believes. It seems that they were just sticking by the law, which indeed was in the Old Testament, that you have to go to court. You can't just kick somebody out. If you're going to end your marriage, you must uh, do official documents. You must sign it and, and, and get it uh, recorded that you have had a divorce. Following up on what he said about adultery, you can see that he's saying, uh, a divorce is um, a serious thing. You, if you're headed in the wrong direction, you can't just, just quit one and go to another. Uh, it's got to be done officially, but he wants to go deeper. He's saying, when you kick out your wife, and she had pledged to be faithful only to you. What in the world is she going to do? She'll end up with someone else. That'll make her an adulteress and the person who's involved with her an adulteress. And so Jesus is talking about the evil of just kicking somebody out. Now he makes an exception. He says if somebody's cheated on you, there is an exception. And yes, divorce has its place for that. But beyond that, he says, the heart of someone who, who will just end their marriage and turn their attentions elsewhere makes everybody involved violate the sanctity of marriage, makes everyone else adulterous. 